On the church calendar, Pentecost falls 50 days after Passover. For our Jewish ancestors, this Pentecost celebration was likely the next significant celebration after Jesus' resurrection to bring an influx of travelers to Jerusalem. It's interesting that these prominent movements, Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, and now this outpouring of the Spirit on the gathered believers, happen when crowds are around. Also on the church liturgical calendar, we notice that this day of Pentecost is the beginning of ordinary time. And while the Church of the Brethren does not tend to be highly liturgical, meaning we don't necessarily subscribe to the liturgical seasons in the way that other Christian traditions often do, it can still be a helpful guide as we think theologically about what we do during worship and what scriptures we might engage during particular seasons of the year. Could I get that slide? I left the clicker down on the bench. Thank you so much. You can see, so this is an image of the church liturgical calendar, and you can see Pentecost in red in this circle that depicts the cycle of themes for the Christian year. The rhythm of study and learning as we move through each season annually and begin again. We've spent the last several months on the top part of this circle, investigating the incarnation and entrance of Jesus in the world during Advent and Christmas, the revelation of Jesus' divinity during the Epiphany, and then very quickly on to Lent and the Passion narrative, and Jesus' crucifixion and death and resurrection, and all that entails for us as followers. And now we will enter ordinary time, not because it is boring or unimportant, but because the presence of the Spirit transforms us in everyday life to be conduits for the outpouring of Christ's love and grace. This lengthy green season, which lasts through the entire bottom of the circle until we get to Advent again, is a time of learning about how to live, studying Jesus' teachings, noticing God at work in the world, and becoming an active part of that. Because not God is not just present during the high times and climactic moments of life, but God is present in all of it, the daily routines and continual learnings of ordinary time, too. I found the text from Numbers about Eldad and Medad to be particularly interesting for this Pentecost day for a couple of reasons. First, I think that we often think that the traditional Acts 2 Pentecost text is the first time that God's spirit flows, and that's not exactly the case. Although there are unique things about the Acts story, including a movement through a group of believers, not just the leaders, and the interesting response by the observers and suggestion that these people must be drunk. It's interesting what assumptions tend to arise when there is a lack of understanding about what is happening. But the Numbers 11 story about Eldad and Medad bring up some interesting questions about the Spirit's movement. Moses hasn't been having a really good go of it. The Israelites have been wandering for a while, which I think we will hear more about just to give a plug for our summer theme called Wanderings in June and July. So the Israelites have been wandering for a while and they aren't very happy. I mean, it's been a while. It's been a long while, years. They've been following Moses away from the previous life of captivity and enslavement in Egypt towards a promise of something better, something none of them have ever seen with their own eyes. Talk about taking a step in faith. But the Israelites are getting frustrated. The very first chapter, very first verse, excuse me, of this chapter 11 says, the people fell to grumbling over their hard life. And it wasn't easy. They are physically exhausted. They are tired of the same food day after day. They are challenging Moses' leadership. God hears it and isn't too happy. Moses hears it too. He's frustrated. His leadership is being questioned. He needs help. And so God provides help. God tells Moses to gather some trusted leaders and God will share the spirit with them that he has given to Moses so that Moses is not leading alone. 
This very much reminds me of this idea that we talked about during the installation of the priesthood of all believers. It's a very Protestant concept, but it was also strongly held by and somewhat expanded on by both Anabaptists and Pietists, our theological ancestors. This idea suggests that everyone is called to ministry, to spiritual work, not just professional clergy. And this was actually one of the six main points in a foundational pietist text called Pia Desideria, or Pious Desires, written by Philip Jacob Spener in 1675. This morning, I was installed as a set-apart minister, a pastor of this congregation, but I can assure you that I very much see our ministry together as exactly that, our ministry together. I feel great assurance that any spirit that God has laid on me has also been shared with every one of you. And it is through that spirit that we can work to practice peace, service, and openness to all together, following Jesus' model and teachings, much like Moses and his co-leaders from his community. And then the the Numbers text takes an interesting turn. The leaders that Moses chose were to report to the tent or the tabernacle to receive the spirit and then prophesy. But Eldad and Medad, two of the leaders who had been selected, didn't go to the tent. They stayed back at the camp. And yet, even though they weren't in the right place at the right time, God's spirit still rested on them and they prophesied. They shared God's message somewhere else in other circumstances. An unidentified young man and Joshua both came to report to Moses that this was happening, that these two guys, Meldad, (laughs) that's, I'm gonna combine them, Medad and Eldad, you know who I mean, right? (laughs) Were prophesying without having followed the correct process and procedure. Moses hears them out, but then questions their conclusion. Are you jealous for my sake? If only all the Lord's people were prophets with the Lord placing his spirit on them. I think this story raises some interesting questions. Where does authority lie? Who or what decides when and where and how God's spirit can move? What happens next? In the Numbers text, the next part of the story that we didn't read isn't so fantastic. Not only did God send the spirit to help Moses, but you remember how I mentioned that the Israelites were fussing about their food? Eating the same thing day after day, manna, manna, and more manna. They were craving meat, like a burger, not just manna. Well, God helped with that too, sending quail for meat. Lots of quail. So much quail, so much quail that the people got sick from all the quail. I think one of the takeaways from this Numbers 11 story and the Acts 2 Pentecost story too is that God, through God's spirit, provides what we need. Sometimes that doesn't look like we hope or like we prefer. Gifts of the spirit to those who don't deserve it through our eyes. Fear that if others get it, we won't be able to get it also, whatever it is. Focusing on our human desires and cravings, which aren't always in alignment with God's spirit. So as I was holding these texts together, I found kind of three big ideas that stood out to me. Things we might wanna pay attention to and let simmer a bit on this fiery, Pentecost Sunday burner. Number one, the spirit is not limited and the spirit is not ours to control. God's spirit is not limited by time or place or space or human design. Our human-centric scarcity mindset does not jive with the abundance of God's kingdom. It is not our job to restrain the sacred empowering of God. It is not even necessarily our job to try to figure it out. The movement of the spirit can be found in surprising places. 
not just in churches and synagogues and mosques and chapels and temples. The spirit can be found in bustling streets and workplaces and homes and backyard fire pits and in cars and back at the camp where me dad and El dad stayed instead of going to the tent with the other 70. In Acts, we recognize the spirit in Peter, but it was also found in unnamed pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. In Numbers, the spirit was given by the Lord to Moses, a familiar name, but also to Medad and Eldad, never to be heard from again in the biblical text. Also notable, Peter and Moses both lent support to the unknowns, acknowledging, affirming, and amplifying the movement of the spirit in these other people who were gathered. For Peter, this means clarifying that no, these people are not drunk, and they are actually living out what was prophesied in the familiar Hebrew scriptures. For Moses, this means rebuking his right-hand man, Joshua, the one who will eventually be called by the Lord to succeed Moses in leadership of the Israelites and guide them into the promised land. Where do you sense the leading of the Spirit in our community? Or maybe the better question is, where do you sense the Spirit leading out of our community? We hope that the Spirit is found here. And also, it's okay if it's found elsewhere. Take it with you. Notice it in others. The spirit found in other places does not lessen the spirit's presence here. The working of the spirit in one leader does not deplete the spirit's work in another. The movement of the spirit in one gathered group of Christ followers does not dampen the movement of the spirit in another gathered group. Thankfully and miraculously, quite honestly, it's not a competition. It's not a zero sum game. In fact, as much as we believe, and I do not disagree, that we have here at Elizabethtown Church of the Brethren a unique and important message to share with the world of the way that the Spirit moves in these people, in this place, at this time, other congregations and faith groups feel that way about their message too. The Spirit's display of God's love is not just one flavor. A helpful image, for me anyway, is that of candlelight. I think of our Christmas Eve candlelight service. And as I pass the light to my neighbor, I don't lose light as their candle illuminates. The spirit is not limited, and the spirit is not ours to control. Number two, the spirit responds to the right motivation. Perhaps part of the reason that the people got quail sick was because their hearts were not in the right place. They were desiring that help for personal reasons. They had what they needed, but they wanted more. They wanted something else. How then can we find the right motivation to engage with the Spirit? Is there only one right motivation? How can we refocus our motivation to align with God's work in the world. That pietist text that I mentioned earlier, the Pia de Sediera, had some other important points in addition to the idea that everyone is in ministry together, not just pastors and set-apart leaders. The pietist movement was a pushback against Christian practice that was perceived to be doctrine-based, intellectualized, a theological exercise. Pietism sought to bring spirit back in, heart, not just head. And so Spainer's writing included a suggestion that scripture be read more and studied together, that this should become the basis, not just tradition and doctrinal statements. He suggested more attention by teachers and preachers to sharing the good news of God's love through Jesus, not just seeking their own professional advancement and internal personal plans and desires. He suggested that one can be rooted in the foundations of their faith practice and beliefs, but be gentle when engaging with those who have a different understanding and rely on God's love to help lead toward unity. 
and he suggested that, and I quote, it is by no means enough to have knowledge of the Christian faith, for Christianity consists rather of practice. The spirit isn't just something we hear and know and understand. It is something to which we respond. And the last, the spirit of the living God will fall on us. Will we be open to it? I'm not sure why, but since I was a child, I have always heard that hymn that we sang earlier, Spirit of the Living God, and thought of a gentle rain shower. I think it's the fall of fresh language. It has always made me think of raindrops of spirit tickling my head as it soaks through my hair, tiny sprinkles collecting on the shoulder of my jacket and eventually joining to make larger drops which roll down my sleeve. Quite different from the violent wind and the tongues of fire we read about in Acts 2, but I think it's okay to use more than one metaphor. Will we put ourselves in the rain shower of the falling spirit? Will we be open to getting a little wet or will we put up an umbrella to keep us dry? Will we be open to the chaos at times of the spirit's movement? It might be loud, or it might be really hard to hear. It might come in forms that we do not recognize and do not expect. It might sound like people are talking crazy talk. It might take us a minute to realize what is happening. It doesn't mean we throw our core beliefs and our healthy boundaries out the window. If we are open to this spirit, it will be a continued process of discernment but I think it will be worthwhile. Like all living things need the rain to survive, leaders, and just a reminder that that is all of us, need the spirit to thrive. This is a living God that we worship, an active, moving, churning God whose spirit blows like wind and ignites like fire and surfaces when least expected. The spirit of this living God pours down and soaks the earth with love that is ordinary and love that is extraordinary. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. May it be so.